Hey folks. Hey. Hooray, you made wrong. it. Yeah, I helped to click on the right meeting link. I was so focused on the notary stuff to present. I went oh. to the notary Slack uh, uh, HackMD, so anyway. Oh, okay, all right, that'll do it, okay. Good to see you. <laughs> Hello, folks. All right. Everybody's signing in, awesome. The link here. And let's see. Well, we're almost five after Josh is here. Uh, so, Josh, do you want to kick off for your uh, first update? Sure. Um Yep, just want to give a quick update on the status of the distribution spec rewrite. Um, so I put some links in the HackMD, um, but this is, uh, we, took, we took what's in the rewrite and put it into, we created a fork of the new OCI site and added a specs menu and um, this is live, you can go to it now and check it out. Um, but here's like the new layout of the spec, table of contents. Um, really try to uh, remove a lot of stuff and make it more succinct and have um, just as much information as we need. Um, if we want to add more information later um, after 1.0, I think that that's, that's fine, but this is the minimum you need to know about the spec in order to implement it. And all over the place we have, um, you know, so this is a section that describes about pooling. Uh, I'll, I'll switch to the push section. Um, so here's how to push a blob at a manifest. Um, there's several different ways to do it. And each of these has these endpoints and we have identifiers for each of these endpoints now in a table. So if you click on this, it'll take you down to this table of endpoints. You can see 4B is the post to the um, blob upload endpoint. And then we've updated the, um, the accepted failure codes to allow for what most registries were doing. For example, um, it wasn't written in the spec, but many registries were returning 405 on delete. Um, and then there was the other one, which was Oh, I think we still need to update it, but some of these uploads should allow a 202 and a 201. But, and then we also noticed, there's a few odd things I just want to bring up that we noticed. Um, the error codes, we changed the language to say that if there is a response body in JSON format, that it must adhere to this error code section. But many registries are just returning a 400 status empty body and things like that. Um, but we say if you do use this format, these are the, the actual code must be one of these values. Um, so there's there's a few like liberties we're taking with this, um, but all in the name of making it work best for how registries are implementing this. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to bring up that's a little bit questionable is um, we noticed we weren't referencing any, we weren't describing the manifest in detail or the digest. So we decided to link to um, the image spec, which describes the manifest and digest. So I'm wondering what people's thoughts are on that. Um, but just to close up, um, yeah, if you if you're interested in like getting, you know, you like how this looks and want this to get in, we have a number of open um, pull requests that are under number tracked under number 163, and these are just each of these updates um, as miniature updates built on top of the last one, so it's a lot easier to review each of these individually. Um, that's pretty much all I have, but I am interested to know how people think, feel about referencing image spec in distribution spec. 
it seems kind of obvious. Is, was, what's, what's the pushback? Because to me, it just seems obvious. I'm curious why you're, seems like somebody was pushing back or had questions. Um, well, my, th my thoughts, I, I guess if there's no pushback, there's no pushback. Um, my thoughts are is that image spec is very specific to container image. And I feel like we're working on making this more general purpose. So I don't know if there's requirements on the manifest that are specific to images that would not be to um, Steve, like some of the artifacts. Gotcha. Questions. So Okay, so this is kind of in the subject of the refactoring. So you're, you're kind of focused on the formatting of the doc without refactoring content, per, where content lives. It's just the format of the content. So you're kind of keying into we're using the manifest and the manifest list as things that can contain an image, but they can contain things that are, aren't an OCI image as well. And that's, that's kind of what you're getting at. I, yeah, I, I guess, um, so we started by writing the conformance tests a few months ago, and we're building the spec based on what we're testing. And we're testing for a certain format of the manifest that's based on the Im image spec Go libraries, I believe. Um, Peter, I don't know if you're, yeah, if you can verify, but that, yeah. So I'm, I just, I know there was a discussion with the distribution spec maintainers, like um, how much we should reference that spec, but I think it sounds right. I think, I believe yeah, it's right. To be fair, Josh, the intention of the distribution spec was to write, implement distribution of the images. Correct. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so yeah, you know, we shouldn't, take make it upside down and say no you can't we shouldn't refer to it, it it's it's perfectly fine though also to say you know other types of artifacts will also be supported by the distribution spec right yeah not, i just i i haven't read through the image spec manifest spec so i would have to see if that is in uh contention with no it's not fire field. okay that's what i thought it, it is not manifest yeah sorry go ahead mike no, no, I would just say it, it, it's not. The, yeah, it, does, it doesn't say you can only use OCI, you know, image references. It just, it just, you know, isolates the OCI declaration so that you can't, you can't use it for something else besides that, right? It's not, it's not saying you can't add additional, you know, mind types. Right. Yeah, and and the other one was digest, which was redefined in the current distribution spec. So figured it was best to keep that definition in one place as well. So the yeah. digest, I actually would put in the distribution spec, actually. Why is that? Because I don't, or maybe it goes with, so Mike had opened up a good, or I, I think it was Mike opened up a good one as the result of this conversation of having manifest, the manifest definition and the manifest list definition pulled up to another repo. Um, so it can be referenced by these two. And maybe the definition of a digest should be pulled up as well. Uh, hmm. So well, I, I in, in any case, I mean, this, it's, this is all up for review. So your comments in writing would be much appreciated. Um, but I mean, just, just to, you know, for example, in the image spec, it's talking about digests doing different types of SHAs, not just 256 which I believe we aren't, you know, Docker distribution, I think expects SHA-256, but I think it's designed in a way it could allow different types of um, digests. Right, yeah, so we should, it, it's one of those things where it's a, you know, recommenda recommendation, not a requirement. Right? Which SHA type is being used, right? We, sh we shouldn't lock that down. Yeah, so um, that's pretty much it, just a summary. So um, just working on pushing this all through. If you have comments on the general approach to this, um, we are uh, you know, attempting to rip out a lot of language from the existing spec, just to make it a lot easier to consume. So um, if you see value in certain parts that have been taken out, um, all ears to you know, reverse that. So. Sounds good. All right, thank you. Was that, that was issue 163 as well? Is that what, those were both under it? Um, 
what, so 163 has a collection of um, miniature updates, which uh, comprises the entire uh, the entire rewrite. So yeah, 163 is like the top level this year. Cool. Okay, well, I guess that, that I was waiting for the second topic, which I thought that was it, but I, it's in part of that, uh, sorry. So yeah, I guess the next thing is the notary v2 update. Um, so we've been uh, spending time on as a break out of this. So if you remember, uh, it's gone back quite a while now, uh, where we've kind of recognized that images and other things, you know, images, certainly, if you just take pure images that are in a registry, we've been struggling that it, the signing solution is just not viable. So we have spent a bunch of work um, over a long time now. And last year we finally kicked off uh, a really concerted effort to do it. So we've been making some updates. Um, I'm actually kind of dancing a little bit here because what I'd like to do is uh, Justin and I have to record uh, a session update for KubeCon this week. And I figured I would use it a little bit as a drive run to run through. So I've been scrambling this morning to put together the slides. So I'm actually gonna walk through that as a presentation. Um, so let me share my screen and here. All right, can you guys see my screen? Do I have an axe? Yeah, 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 it looks good. Thank you. I went for like five minutes the other day and in pause mode of about to share my screens. So I just want to make sure. Um, okay, so what is Notary uh, V2? Uh, so we really wanted to kind of build it into the core registry. Uh, turns out we can actually, we believe we can leverage a lot of the registry artifact support or OCR artifact support there. Whereas in Notary V1, it's this whole additional service that you have to run. And it's pretty heavyweight uh, for an operator to run. And it has a bunch of issues associated with uh, tags exist in both places. There's two different databases. There's a whole bunch of details. There's actually another slide that I'll go through uh, in that detail. Uh, we certainly want to have things be secure. Um, and we're, what exactly does that mean? Uh, so that's been an interesting conversation as well as in what we've been scoping as there's an attestation to its authenticity. It came from, I'm staring at Mike, so it came from IBM. It came from uh, Red Hat, it came from Docker, or wherever it may be, or actually the Docker one's an even more interesting one. Um, so that's, we, and then there's this extra certification, which is what you'll see me refer to in Docker with the Docker scenario. Uh, we wanted to get, we believe, we want to get rid of trust on first use. Uh, there's no implicit permissions, um, and we do want to have secure private keys and PKI support. Um, Usability was a big problem. Um, I actually should invert this. So if I'm going to use portability is one of the biggest problems that we have. Uh, if you find some certified content or sign content on Docker Hub, or if you take software from Microsoft on MCR to Microsoft.com, that's our, the registry we serve things from. You should be able to run Microsoft software that you got from MCR or any software you got from Docker Hub in your private registry. It doesn't support that. So we need to be able, we need to, be able to support portable signature movement within a registry, when you promote it within a registry or across registries. Um, so if you can get past that, <laughs> then we also need the commands to be simple, usable. You know, it, it shouldn't be a rocket science uh, to uh, be able to use these things. Uh, Multi-tenant, I use the MCR and the Docker ones. The scenario is, is obvious ones. Uh, we want to make sure that this content isn't just, the signature isn't just for Azure. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense for any, just for Docker or AWS. We need to make sure that as you get content, sign content from registry one, that it can move to registry two. And I'll, I'll have an animation that shows that. Uh, part of that is, uh, and, and on-prem is part of that as well, by the way. Uh, and then offline and air-gapped, uh, we tend to refer to air-gapped as these like really esoteric uh, submarines and oil platform kind of things. Um, as many of you have seen, uh, we have customers that like they're willing to move to the cloud if they can get the same kind of private IP uh, environments that they have on-prem. So we're seeing more and more customers going there, but there can't be any public internet access. So whether it's physically air-gapped in, in some of the more constrained environments or the 
customer makes an air gap inside a public cloud, we have to be able to support those kind of scenarios. Uh, so Notary V1 doesn't need it, that's okay. Like we've learned, um, but that's what we wanna solve with Notary V2. So if we look, and by all means, folks, just jump in and interrupt if you have questions. That's, uh, it, it, that's fine, it's helpful to get that. Um, so for V2, we really wanna support offline signing. When offline signing isn't just air gapped, it's I could sign something in a secure environment that has no connectivity and because the keys might be so secure that I can't actually get to them in any kind of uh, outside of a secure environment. So I need offline uh, signing. And then I might take the signature and the cart content and move it into a registry, or I might stick it on a USB stick. We need to be able to support multiple signatures. Um, so we'll, we'll see this again in the animation, It'll make a little more sense. Uh, something that's iterated about uh, some of the things that have come up is what we refer to as ephemeral clients. Uh, in this serverless world, we're trying to get to the point where in a compute environment, we could take some very general vanilla type of compute thing that's there for any customer and say, Mike, this is now yours. Uh, you own it for the, for the life of that thing running. Uh, there's no previous state on it. And you can run a container, run it fast, run it as a function, get it securely. Uh, and then as soon as you're done with it, that is released back to the ecosystem uh, and you're not paying for anything. So we really can't assume that there's state on the clients. We talked about cross cloud, air gap, so forth. Um, the keys that we wanna be able to use, which has been an interesting topic as well. Uh, we need to make sure that every cloud provider can, or in wherever it is, including open source uh, solutions, can have a, a key vault solution that it uh, retrieves and provides the management of those keys. And then the last one that's come up uh, that we've been having some conversations on recently is what does it mean to get a key? What kind of keys do we support? Uh, we want to make sure that, and I was using Josh as an example when he was building Auras, uh, he shouldn't need to spend lots of money or do something big to be able to get a key. He should be able to get something that he could sign this content with and, and it be acceptable. And it needs to scale all the way up to the large vendors that might use you know, X509 and CAs and so forth. So we wanna make sure that there's no barrier to entry there as well. So hopefully this, this flow, uh, it, I, I'm a visual person. This is the way I like to communicate. I, I hope others ex, uh, digest it as well. So the workflow that we wanna be able to support is we have this Webbits network and their create a net, network monitor software. They have their own build environment. They have their own, where it doesn't matter whether it's on-prem or some cloud, doesn't matter. They're building software. They happen to build an image. That's how their software runs. They have a software bill of materials. They associate it with that image. So it has everything that's in it. Um, it has the source code of any open source licensing, the whole GPL thing. Um, and then I group them all together in an OCI index and I say, yep, this is my software. I wanna sign it with uh, the Wabbit Network's key. So uh, now I know that this software, and ignore Docker, I didn't mean to bring that in at the same time. So Docker's not there yet. Uh, I've signed it offline in my environment with the Wabbit Network's key. And now you can see that content and it's got some authenticity that it came from them. Now I wanna publish that content. I wanna put it up on, I'm using the word aggregator, it's probably not the right term, but I wanna be able to, uh, uh, not agitator, aggregator. I want to put some content up there for discovery. Now, when I first put it up on Docker Hub, it's got the Wabbit Networks key, but who knows who that is? Like, it doesn't mean anything to anybody. It could be bad, evil.com that posts something up there as well. Uh, evil.com doesn't uh, usually say something like that. It'll say something else that makes it seem friendly. So it's up there and that's fine. If you want to trust from Wabbit Networks, that's totally cool. But this is where it gets kind of interesting is because we support additional signatures, this might become certified content. And Docker does something that it decides that it's certified content. And instead of just giving it this little glyph on it, now you could say that it's got an extra key and I can only pull content that has the Docker cert on it. That might be a policy a company rolls out. So now I got the Acme Rockets company. This is the consumer of all this content. They have their private registry that they want to deploy stuff to. And so now I'm going to pull this Wabbit Networks uh, network monitor software into my environment. 
Um, it's got the Docker key. It's also got their key. That's great. Um, inside of my environment, I might have a deploy script, like a Helm chart that I want to deploy this with. So I author that, I push it into my own registry, uh, and I sign it because I want to know that this content really came from me. And I'm also going to uh, sign all of the other content as well because I'm going to take that uh, network monitor software. I want to validate it works in my environment. I might get a security update from it, but the security update may not work in my, my environment. So I'm not going to blindly roll it out. I'll do some validation in my environment, do some scanning, testing, whatever I decide that inside of Acme Rockets, I trust this thing and it can be deployed. So now it's got a third signature on it. My policy manager says, I'm only going to let content that's signed by Acme Rockets go out. It actually doesn't care that it came from Docker or uh, Wabbit Networks because that was a pre-check pre earlier on. At this point, only Acme certified content can be deployed. And the idea is that some kind of policy manager, maybe open policy agent, can do some validation on some of those things as well. So that's the workflow. Uh, oh, and this whole thing is in an air-gapped environment. So all of those keys and certificates and everything needs to be able to work in that environment. The things uh, for, sorry for colorblind people, this is not, I'm not being very uh, aware here. There's the, the blue stuff is what we're scoping as part, actually this isn't, but the, the icons for signatures, the registry, that's the stuff that we're scoping for Notary V2. The policy agent, policy manager, all these other things, that's not in scope for what we're doing. We're trying to really just create this signature infrastructure. So great, Sketch is wonderful. That's kind of interesting. Uh, somebody's chatting here and I'll pull it up. All right, hold on, let me move this over here. Uh, I, I, I can say it, I didn't want to bother you in the middle of your presentation, but. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go for it, Phil. Yeah, no, I was just curious if you, if anyone had caught wind of Portieris, a uh, uh, open source project from IBM that fits that bill of a admission controller for checking signatures. It supports Notary V1 and Red Hat simple signing today. But Sweet. anyway, I, it's I'm an really interesting- I'm glad you said that out loud because I have no idea how you pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what it means either, but I'm sure it's a Greek word for something. <laughs> Well, that's good. I, I actually, be, uh, when I show you some of the way we're thinking about signatures, might, uh, I'd be really curious about what you think about. Because we actually did look at some of the IBM signature stuff too. So the biggest thing that we've noticed as we've been delving into this project is how do you establish that communication across a whole bunch of people that have their own expertise? So I've been uh, kind of using, this is actually we've spent a lot of time on to figure out how do we do this because it's been a challenge. So let's just say I want to build a house and we're all gonna build it together. What does that mean? Like, what exactly do you, does that mean to you? Is, you know, you probably have some assumption of a style. I can draw a little, you know, triangle-ish square house and you're gonna go, we're obviously not building that. Maybe we're building an A-frame. Um, you're gonna have some opinions or thoughts or biases around what you think that means. And you have some expertise that also influences your thoughts about what that's gonna be. And the bathroom one was an interesting when we were talking about this um, and making some assumptions around some things. So one of the, uh, we were talking about sketching and I put this thing out, uh, uh, Cormac, as we're too many Justins, uh, made some comment, was asking about something like, okay. And he, and he basically was building on the analogy, he goes, where's the bidet? We don't have bidets in the US. We hadn't thought about that. We probably do need bidets after the toilet paper thing in COVID, uh, but that's not something I would even think about uh, adding. So if I, we just went through an assumption of what's in a bathroom or what's in a key, I would have never have thought to even put that in there where to him, he probably wouldn't even mention it because it's just assumed to be there. So we really want to be able to facilitate this kind of conversation and writing things down certainly helps, but even words have a lot of interpretation. And we also want to make sure that we can enlist the various trades, right? You're building a house, you have lots of people come in. Uh, I don't know all the details about key management and cryptography and all that kind of stuff. I'm bringing in or trying to facilitate the people that do know that. 
the people that do know that, like Niaz, who's been awesome, he's been facilitating our key management conversations, he may not know registries really well, but we could help with that. So how do we you know, do this model to figure out how does everybody work together? Like how does the HVAC person know where to put things to avoid going through pipes or pipes going through it and so forth? So this is not new to do this, right? If anybody's been to Barcelona, there's uh, Anthony Gaudi who had this vision on how he wanted to build churches and other buildings actually uh, in Barcelona. And he had a pretty creative way of doing things. So the example here is he wanted to build a church and the churches in, in Europe overall, I guess, had these big, huge butchers, butchesses. Yeah, now I need Amy's help or, or uh, Phil's on how to pronounce that. But anyway, to support these massive buildings. And these are hundreds of years old. They were blocking light. They were taking up lots of space where people needed to be in. And he had this vision that he wanted to make it much more fluid, much more open and much more lightweight. Uh, Boutress, but, but, okay. I, I'm not sure I can read how it's pronounced there, but thank you, Josh. I'll, I need to click one of those things to figure it out. Anyway, so he had this vision and he started uh, sketching this thing. And you're looking at this and this isn't the most best sketched of some of the things that he's shown, but it, it was the only thing public domain I could find at the time. And there, what was happening is like, how do we build this thing? Like this, this spire in the center is huge. There's all these other elements off to the left and right of this thing that were really complex. So he built this model, which is really amazing, where he wanted to see this natural curve and he just uses string with birdshot in these little bags that he was able to kind of form the, the structures. And if you rotate it around and when you go to the, the, uh, the, the Sagrada Familia, there's like a mirror on the bottom so you can kind of see how this is formed. If you can sketch, you know, make, make your mind kind of make the, this, uh, the bags go away and you just focus on the lines, you could see this very natural curve kind of forming and you know, here and here and here and so forth. And that's what he was using to facilitate this. And then he went off and built more models and more models and the different trades would come in and figure out, okay, if that's what you're trying to build, now I know where to work. So that's the biggest thing that we've been trying to do to kind of get this iterative approach. And every commit is not the design. It is a prototype. It's a model. It's a way for us to facilitate the conversation. And one of the things that we've been struggling with over the last several weeks was how do we support uh, the update framework, which is part of uh, Notary V1, uh, specifically for rollback protection. Uh, and the more we were digging into it, for instance, we realized we, we really don't have enough to figure out how to make this work in a usable fashion in a secure way with ephemeral clients and others. So we've kind of said, all right, we're gonna focus more on this phased approach because we're gonna focus on the core requirements of what we really need for signing of content. And so now you see is like, all right, we're gonna sign content. We're gonna allow content to be moved between within and across registries. And now we're getting into this interesting conversation, the type of keys we'll support. And then we're, we're trying to get that done before we drill into some details around registry persistence and retrieval. So that's, the, uh, that's kind of like where we are now. And I was gonna go into uh, some of the designs we've been thinking about. Any questions on our, on our approach so far? Or? I got the okay from Phil. So um, the way we've been kind of blocking this out, right? If I kind of took that big sketch of what we're trying to do and say, here's the, the pieces we're trying to work on to get people to think about the blocks. We have an NV2 client and this thing will do signing and verification. That's it. It's, it doesn't do any push, push me, pull use, doesn't do any of that stuff. It's just, it can sign content offline and it can verify the content um, that, it's, that it's signing. So therefore you can give it an artifact and it'll generate a signature. And then when I have those two separate artifacts, cause one's an artifact, the, the image, a helm chart, a singularity, whatever, uh, a marky mark. I, I gotta find your marky mark, Josh. I, I gotta give me a link for that again. Um, cause I look up marky mark, I get all kinds of results. So the idea is that I can take any kind of artifact and I can sign it. And then I have these two things and I can now push them to a registry and we're just using the Aura's client to be able to push those things up to a registry. So this is kind of a, 
the, the blocks that we're using to facilitate this first round of conversation. One of the things that we started with was an X509 cert. Um, so I can take that and I'm curious what you guys think about where the starting point there is. And if I, this, this was the interesting one. So if you tell somebody you need this bathroom and you need a shower and you know, bidet and you know, the, 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 the toilet off to the side or whatever, you know, but there's like lots of wall space and, you know, somebody puts a creative pattern on the wall. I hadn't thought about that. That works really well. Or maybe it's a glass shower that's open and no door. So you get these new ideas that pop in that you hadn't really thought about before. So Shi Wei, who's been doing the, uh, this work, the, the, the signing work here, um, came up with this idea that you can take the subject and the C name of their certificate and associate it with the registry. So if you notice here, the C name says registry.example.com. So that's what I'm going to sign. Maybe I should use Wabbit Networks, but the point is there's a registry URL that we're going to associate with the signing of the content. Yeah. I heard somebody. Nope. Okay. So if I take a Docker build and I give it a Docker file and I'm sorry, I realized uh, I, didn't, I didn't keep these consistent. So assume this says registry.example.com. Uh, uh, and now I can generate, so the, the next part was we realized that Docker, the current Docker client pre-container D doesn't actually have the manifest anywhere local. So uh, Shiwei was able to create this uh, plugin to Docker that basically generates a manifest from an image. So he's going to take this image, generate a manifest from it, and now I have this file on disk that is the manifest for that image. And now the, the experience that we've been playing with is this NB2 can sign it. The method is X509 uh, because we want to support multiple methods. And then it's got a key, and then it's got the registry, and at least here I'm doing it consistent. Uh, so I want to sign it. Um, that's the tag that I'm signing, uh, and I'm going to output a signature file, and I'm signing this with this manifest. So as a result, uh, if you format the output, because the other interesting topic has been about the whole formatting of JSON and, and encoding and so forth, but we'll keep that aside for a second. As I take this sign block, this is what gets generated. It's got a digest of the manifest. So this is the image manifest, it's digest. Um, there's elements of the key, the expiration, not before. Remind me what IAT is, Sajay. Or somebody. I forget what I. Issue that. Issue that. Issue that. Okay, thank you. Because um, with all these long signatures, we couldn't have put a couple more characters in there, but that's just the PM speaking. Okay, so I have this, uh, the signature content. It's got the digest, the size. Um, uh, Derek was suggesting we should put the uh, media type in here of the digest. Not, it's not a, that it's a runnable image, it's the OCI image manifest type so that it becomes a fully formatted um, uh, descriptor. And then what we're saying is at this point, this image has these tags associated with it. Because one of the other requirements that we've said is signing should not change the digest or the tag that it is signed because we want to be able to um, have a developer build something, push it to the registry. I add a signature to it later and I can also add uh, another signature as you saw inside of Acme Rockets, a signature is added to something that isn't even rebuilt because they already have it. So the idea is that at this point, this signature is referring to these um, tags, registry name and tags. So you can see that align there. Now, what gets generated is this is the signature, and of course it fills the whole screen, so I just short truncated it here. But in this object, here is the actual output of the signature that signed this content. And I'm going to stop there, actually, that's probably a good stopping point. <laughs> I just read Amy's comment. Thoughts? So how do you, I mean, my questions are mainly more on the other side, like how do, uh, maybe you're about to go on to that, I don't know. But um, 
how do you, like you say, you're not going to use trust in first use. So how do people get the public keys? Ah, that's great. Um, okay, so key acquisition is something that uh, I've pur purposely ignored right now and let uh, Niaz work on the key management portions of it. So yes, there's uh, a bunch of waving here that we're building a bathroom without a floor. Uh, we haven't moved to five. The floor is just there somehow. We haven't, we've ignored that part. We'll obviously need to solve that problem uh, as part of this. Okay. And, and revocation is the other one that springs to mind. Yeah. So if you, um, so in the working group, we've been, Nias has been driving a lot of the key uh, management, or driving the key management. And there is a PR on the requirements specific around uh, key management. Revocation is absolutely, you know, part of that scenario. Great question. Yeah, and so like um, obviously, like some of the times references, you know, change the point of different digests, but yeah, this signature is only good for that digest, right? Correct. It's actually a combination of the digest and tag. Now you could sign a digest only. There's you don't have to have tags in there. Yeah. Uh, okay. But that's but you have the option of doing both because that's the thing that we hear a lot of people. Um, get into is they, a lot of people wind up deploying with digest because it's the only thing they trust that doesn't change. Um, it doesn't make very good usability for when you're looking in kube control and all these other dashboards and thing that just this long, long string that's not, even if you can get the whole thing, you're certainly not going to memorize it. So you want something short and usable, uh, definitely this, not the latest. We don't, friends don't let friends build on latest. Um, but tags are immutable. So we want to be able to have a way to kind of lock the two together. Yeah, that makes sense. So I'll go a little bit further just to spur some more ideas, a uh, little conversation. So we want to be able to persist it as an artifact. Uh, so basically we just take the media type, we, we generate a manifest. So this manifest, if you notice, did I put it in here? Uh, no, okay. So if you look closely, the media type here of the, or the, rather the config object is, the content of that config object is this. This is what we're actually going to take the whole signature and save it as a media type. Oh, sorry, save it as a config object and it is a manifest with zero layers. And if we look closely, you'll see that the config media type says it's a CNCF notary config v2. So this is how we're basically saying this is a notary v2 uh, formatted uh, signature object or media type artifact type. And then of course its digest uh, is, is this here. So the idea is now you can put those two things in the registry as I uh, showed before. Questions on that? Oh, sorry, I'm just gonna bring up something. Really, no questions? I, I've got one. Um, yeah, go. <laughs> <laughs> so on that, that OCI manifest, have you put thought into um, users who, who, or clients who, who maybe aren't interested in the signature and just want the layers? Because I'm, I'm thinking about the round trips required to actually get the image content. And it's already a lot today. And this just added at least one more. So I'm missing something with that. I'm sorry. So what you're, say that again, and maybe try, I'll try to understand it. So, so let's say this, this manifest that is the signature that points to the, the final manifest and objects and everything. Right. Let's say this got pushed to a specific tag. When I go Docker pull that tag, if I'm not interested in the signature, it's got to, well, even if I am, it's got to grab, grab this first manifest, Ah, uh, okay. It's the then, it, then it has to actually follow the, the pointer and grab the second manifest, which is going to be that signature object. Then it's got to follow that pointer to get the manifest list. Then it's got to follow that pointer to get the actual image manifest for the architecture I'm interested in. Then it's got to go get the image config object plus every layer object. That's a lot of round trips. Yeah, so let me, uh, there, is, there is some that we're not changing, but to be fair, I was just looking for the picture that described this. Um, so the way, and this goes back to the distribution spec that we're, we'll propose here. 
So the, the model is that this, this signature object doesn't actually need to get tagged. It's actually just, it happens to be in the registry with a, a think of it as an untagged uh, artifact that's in the registry. And you don't actually ask for it. What you're going to do is you're going to ask for the, the uh, you're going to ask for the tags, sorry, the signatures for this artifact because your deployment script says, I'm trying to deploy example v1.0. So as part of the nv2 client, what it does is says, hey, uh, well, not the nv2, the full workflow. What the full workflow does is says, hey, registry, what signature objects do you have, for example, colon v1? Oh, okay, so you're, you're envisioning a, a registry extension or something to, to do that second lookup. Exactly. Okay. That so makes sense. you're basically doing your normal Docker workflow, you know, your normal artifact workflow where it just says, hey, yes, I do ask for a tag. I can ask for a digest. And then it comes back and says, you know, here's the, the layers that make up this thing. And, uh, but before it, you know, it, it gets that information back, one of the things the client, the NV2 client would do when you plug it into the whole workflow is that you would have this flag that says, hey, I only uh, support trusted content. So now it's before it even starts pulling the layers, it's going to say, hey, registry, what signature objects do you have? And it could even say, by the way, I only care about the Acme Rocket signature. So do you have an Acme Rocket signature for this tag? And the registry says, yes, here it is. You take a look at it. You can evaluate the signature. Does the signature match the manifest for the example V1? And if it does and you're happy, then you would proceed to pulling the layers. Make sense? Yeah, thanks. Cool. Okay. Um, I was looking for the verify command, so give me a second here. Uh, let me just bring this up. I didn't get the slides complete. So in the so here we're using signing. We sign uh, offline verification. So the idea here is that I can say nb2 verify. I Pat, and this is, uh, sorry, let me do this one. I, they were not all up to date yet. So I say verify this config, uh, this file, that's basically the config file that I got. Because remember, we're, we're right now we're breaking in smaller components. This isn't, we don't have a Docker with Notary v2 client built yet. So we're just saying there's a nv2 client that knows how to verify manifest to signatures. So we say verify this signature object to this manifest with this cert. And as long as that will pass or fail based on the cert matches, you know, the contents of uh, the registry name uh, for the C name has to match. And as long as that comes back up and it's valid, then you're good. Um, yeah, that's kind of that part. The interesting things that we've been kind of you know, chewing on as we've got this sketch and we're trying to figure out and people come in going, hey, what about this? Um, one of the things that it was kind of interesting is everybody's kind of picking up on this interesting pattern, you know, that I make the analogy of uh, Shui putting on the wall of, hey, I can use the C name for the validation. And we kind of think it's interesting, but what does it really mean? Like, is it something you has to be enforced? So the idea is not that you could only pull it from that registry that's in the list because that kind of defeats the whole point of being able to do uh, you know, private registries. All it's saying is this artifact originally came from this and the certificate matches this. And in theory, you could even go back to this um, uh, origination registry to get the content. What's more interesting is in this example back here that when I put the Acme Rocket signature on this thing, and it has an Acme Rockets cert, and it's got the registry name of registry.acmerockets.com or IO, whatever, that on this, with a policy manager, it could implement something that says, by the way, not only does it have to be signed by me, but the policy manager, not the NB2 client, could say, I will, because it's signed with that registry C name, I'll only allow content to be pulled from that registry. 
So it's like another idea that says you can't go pull from Docker, Docker Hub. You shouldn't be pulling from Docker Hub in production. You shouldn't be pulling from evil.com's registry either. So even if somehow uh, the cert got on, you know, let's say the cert got, you know, compromised or something and on evil.com, it's got bad content for that cert, whatever, and key revocation didn't kick in, whatever the magic pieces are, this policy manager could enforce saying, I'm only going to pull from the Acme Rockets registry. So there's just some interesting things that are kind of becoming a good conversation piece. Of course, this is the more interesting one. The how do we serialize JSON to get a digest is not at all interesting, but we have to get closure on it because there's all kinds of gnarly sharp blasts on that one to figure out. And the other one we're getting into this conversation, I said, is like uh, the keys, because X509 is something that is expensive. Um, we're talking about self-signed certs. We're talking about, you know, let's encrypt. We're talking about some other things. Um, and this is the, uh, the next kind of round of conversations that I, I see us having. Um, so that's kind of where we're at at this point. Um, we've got you know, 10 minutes here for conversations. So what do people think? I mean, it's not really notary too. It's, it's kind of something new, isn't it? Uh, tell me what you're thinking. <laughs> I guess it wasn't a question, it was a statement, but... Uh, well, what it, all right, so give me more did into... Say, to be fair, you did say you're hoping to add tough stuff on later, right? Right. But at the minute, this is very different to what I mean. It, it, I, what I mean is this doesn't use notary at all. We're, we're basically starting from, not maybe not quite from scratch, but from, yeah. Yeah, it's fair. We we did say the beginning of Notary V2 when we started the effort that it's not we're not meant to be compatible. Um, and V1 was just it, it has too many limitations for us to try to do any compatibility. And we are reassessing the requirements and um, the fact that things weren't movable kind of made the whole thing dead on arrival. Um, the usability doesn't work. Uh, the the other problem that we're facing is that uh, the way the rollback capabilities work assumes some state on the client because it needs something else to compare with. If the registry is compromised um, and you have to, and somebody rolled it back to what was still signed by Debian, let's say, I'll pick on Debian, um, but it's now considered vulnerable and I've assigned it to that tag. Well, if you can hack the registry, then there's lots of things that you can hack. So. The idea that, uh, as, my, as I understand it, is the way the, the update framework says is like, I've got a stateful client that had some previous state, some time stamps that it can say, hey, is, did this get rolled back? Because it's gotta be after that point. And if you've got an ephemeral client, you, you don't have that model. Um, so we think there's other ways we can achieve that, which is why we, you know, we say we are gonna look at it in this, in this phase too. But we also don't see that being a primary problem in, artifacts that we put in registries at this point. Like we, we see them as their unique deployments. You don't really want to take an update that's got the same tag and deploy it. Mm. What's it really interesting though, is you do on your from statements, right? Like if I say from node nine or whatever the number is now, um, I do want to get an update when node nine has a security patch to it. So there is some capabilities that we actually do believe, and we certainly don't want node nine to be rolled back and we are getting you know, a lot of this content from public registries, even though we validate them in private registries. It's just the, the place that we're getting the most challenges is what I'm trying to deploy is that sign. I'm trying to do an IoT deployment. Do I trust because IoT devices get into very untrusted networks environments? Um, so that's, that's, you're right. Like there is definitely a layered approach. Um, and we are, the way I think about it is notary is a signing solution. And then there's the update framework. Um, so we're kind of peeling it in that layer and saying the notary part, we're definitely gonna do some signing. And if we can get the update portions in there, you know, in a way that makes sense, then we're absolutely gonna do it. Um, the, the other analogy I make is like, look, you can put lots of security things on a, like say on a door. If it's so difficult to open and close every time, then what's the first thing that people do? <laughs> they put a brick in front of the door to keep it open. So we want to make sure that the security solutions that we're putting together for Notary V2 really meet the requirements 
and the usability so that it can actually be used. Yeah, sure. No, that makes sense. And I, I really like the idea that it's actually part of the registry rather than something separate. Yeah, yeah there's okay. some, the IoT one is also interesting because when you get into this nested network stuff, you, you really need a lighter weight you know, registry to be able to run and you know, the, the notary infrastructure is you know, pretty bulky, but you know, every first iteration of something, like the first computer was you know, monstrous and the first portable computer and all these things. So well, the idea is we can scale it down now that we know more. Derek, did I, I know we didn't get all the updates in, but did I talk about it to the way that uh, covered, you know, things that you were talking about? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the only other thing, well, I was still interested in kind of what the output of the key discussion was, like I said, that the trust on first use thing is still something that I have some concern about. Um, but the other is just about the encoding of the JSON. Like, uh, I'm not sure that it's a, it's a thorny one, but I'm not sure that that's solved. It's not. I'll definitely say it's not solved. Um, I was hoping some of the pointers that we had gotten will get us closer. And I want to follow up with, uh, I saw Trishank gave us some feedback from Radu on what they did on CNAB. Um, so yeah, that's the, 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 the frowny face is the one that I'm hoping we can just find something. It's not the most interesting, but it's definitely one of the more complex ones. The, and then the cert stuff, um, and in fact, on the JSON serialization, that, that has been like almost one of the biggest debates that I've seen this so far going on in the, uh, on the PR. The, ex, the cert one is the next one. We, we haven't had a lot of time to kind of drill into that, into what the next steps would be there, other than we, we recognize we need to do something. And, I, and I'm very interested in what other people think. Like, what, what do people feel that they can sign with? What would they say is acceptable that ranges from the hobbyists to the Microsofts and Red Hats and IBMs of the world? Um, I mean, from my point of view, what I want to do is like plug in, you know, my YubiKey and everything else is taken care of and I just don't care what it is. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean, I also wonder if it's worth, you know, looking back at the notary, current, you know, notary project issues and PR, as you can see, contributions from big companies and folks who care about YubiKeys and everything in between on kind of the different formats and hardware they wanted to support. So that, that may be a good indicator people that were trying to use notary v1 had a pretty discrete list of things that met you know their company or corporate or personal interests great yeah we've been i actually remember one of the docker events where they actually gave us ubi, ubi keys like underneath everybody's seat at one point um i think that's what it was again not the yep. cryptographic expert here. Okay, but that's good. Uh, we can go back and look at that too. All right, well, for those that are interested more, we do have the Monday meetings. Um, they're generally 10 a.m. on Monday. We've been doing them earlier at 7 a.m. because some of the folks between uh, that are in APAC region, um, there's the notary Slack channel. Uh, so I'll, um, I'll put the links in the notes that people can go you know, keep up with us there. And we're, we're keeping on churning. Um, I appreciate the feedback. So with that, we'll, uh, I, I did promise that we were going to try to figure out, a, a put up for a time to vote on, uh, on this meeting because we did the 7 a.m. No, we did the evening meetings a couple of times uh, to give others a chance to connect as well. Um, I haven't had time to go wrestle that uh, voting conversation so unless somebody else can volunteer to help there at, at this point we'll just we'll i hope we'll come back to that but right now we'll just we'll stick with 10 a uh, sorry 2 p.m uh same time same channel for next wednesday and uh if there's topics please put it on the agenda and we'll go through it thank you folks. thanks a lot and thank you, Amy and Phil, for posting these videos. They've actually, so they, they've actually been really helpful. I have been getting a lot of feedback that people really appreciate the videos they're watching uh, on their time zone. So. Good. Okay. Cool. Great. Thanks, folks. Have a great day.
enjoy some sun somewhere.